This is of particular interest to me. Um, those of you who know me or know anything about me know that I'm sort of a frustrated architect and I do not design things any chance I can get. I want to encourage you all to come visit the Berman Institute if you haven't been there yet. It is a little gem of a building and we are building a new building over the next few years and um, it will be another architectural marvel, we hope. Um, so uh, it's, it's something that I think is really, really important. So I am really delighted, this is kind of a first for us at the Berman Institute, uh, to have someone who is trained both as a physician, Dr. Anderson is a general internist, uh, but she's also an architect, and it's an unusual combination. Um, she actually started her career as an architect, went to art architecture school at McGill, uh, and then went to medical school in Toronto, and um, last year did a bioethics fellowship at Harvard. And she said that it was really when she discovered bioethics that she kind of discovered the glue uh, to hold a lot of her interests together. Um, which I completely get. Some, not everybody in bioethics would necessarily get that link, but I'm, um, I think it's, it's, I agree, bioethics is, is a great clue. Um, so Dr. Anderson is also doing a geriatrics fellowship now, um, and you describe yourself as a, a dokitech? Dokitech, yeah. Dog, dog okay. Dark and dog was another option. <laughs> <laughs> right, and you did those graphics, which I think are fantastic. Um, so, uh, um, she completed her medical residency at uh, Columbia in New York, um, and she combines educational and professional experience in medicine and architecture, worked on hospital design projects globally, and is widely published in both architectural and medical journals, books, and the popular press, a frequent speaker about the impacts of healthcare design on patient outcomes, staff satisfaction, and related topics that she has done a bioethics fellowship and is currently doing a geriatrics fellowship. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome. Any architects in the audience? So no conflicts to disclose prior to the lecture. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you all for coming today. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. So I wanted to start by talking about the built environment. The impact of the built environment on our health, minds, and behavior is truly immense. And we have emerging evidence now that demonstrates the built environment can have ethical implications, not just for those who are vulnerable or marginalized, but for every one of us. So we think about how a building functions, right? We think about how it stands up and what it looks like. These are core elements to any architecture school and architect. But what about these questions? What good does a building do? For whom? And in what way? I would say that the ethics of built space has been largely understudied in the field of bioethics. But I'd like to show you today through a number of examples the impact that healthcare spaces can have on our minds and behavior. There's also a significant chance that the room we're in right now is actually controlling our minds. There's literature to document that. As North Americans, we spend 90% of our time inside, and those of us in healthcare, 99.9% inside buildings, right? We're always inside. These spaces exert strong and subtle influences on the way our minds function. Architecture, it won't be surprising to say that it can make you feel sad, anxious, tired, distracted. Or architecture can make you highly efficient. It can affect your cognitive abilities, your physical health, and your emotional well-being. And all of these consequences have been reported scientifically. So it's becoming evident in the way spaces are designed that they can have measurable impact. So I guess the question is, how do we bridge the gap between the perspectives of those who design our buildings and those who actually use them? And what is the moral imperative of the healthcare architect to ensure that the buildings we design and build do no harm? This is in Montreal, it's the new Shum Hospital's Passerelle, which is an elevated walkway, it connects two buildings. It's meant for staff use. It's an interesting space, as you can see, so the walls project a constellation of pinpoint light by day from the outside in, but at night, the complete reverse happens. So you get interior artificial lighting that projects dots of light to the passers-by on the street below. 
quite a lovely space, as you can see from the image. Architecture has been called by some inhabited sculpture, even frozen music. Powerful architectural statements can create a sense of awe or serenity for us. And I would bet that you've all probably felt this walking into grand monuments or religious buildings somewhere around the world. But you know, space design doesn't need to be grand to impact us. And everyday spaces, like hospitals, have the power to help us heal or make us sick. This is a children's hospital recently built in the UK, the Alder Hay Hospital. What if I told you now that designers could impact how much and how fast you eat in restaurants just by the color choice of the space? Taste might be the first sense that comes to your mind when you think about food service, but our brain perceives signals much faster through our eyes. So reds and yellows subconsciously trigger hunger. We eat more. One study actually showed that in a restaurant with soft lighting and jazz music playing, people ate 175 fewer calories. And so when people talk about this power of architecture, they frequently refer to the physical characteristics, right? The space, the form, the materiality. But I would say that the power also lies in the void that becomes framed with architecture. And this is one of my most favorite series of black and white photographs from the Time Life series. A photographer has gone to Italy and taken images looking up in one of those narrow streets. And you can see the buildings frame the sky, which is a void, but becomes such a prominent physical shape in the photograph. This creates what some will call an intangible architectural atmosphere, which I would probably argue too that is not only the product of the designers and the architecture, but also the social actions of those who inhabit the spaces. So when we consider the spatial context of health, I think we also have to refocus the built environment to move beyond just being a material backdrop to all of the medical encounters it hosts, towards much more of a meeting formed by the intersection of the buildings, the people, and all of the interactions that occur between them. This is an example of the innovative model of psychosocial oncology care through the Maggie Centers that are present in the UK and now have moved into Hong Kong. Some of you might have heard of these or seen them. Maggie Centers are emotionally charged buildings. They shape the way that cancer care is practiced and experienced for patients in everyday ways through the use of these architectural atmospheres I mentioned. Each center is custom designed. This is Frank Gehry's Maggie Center in the UK, but they follow the same principles. They want to design a more domestic scale than our typical clinical settings that we're used to, with the aspiration to create these atmospheres that counteract a lot of the anxiety people feel going through cancer treatment. Leading architects like Frank Gehry have focused on the notion that cancer care can be drastically improved through good architecture and design. Charles James, Maggie's husband, Maggie had lots of horrific experiences in her cancer treatment, and she and her husband decided to change the way care was delivered through the design of these centers. They commissioned the buildings with the conviction that design can facilitate better practices of care, but in doing so affect our health outcomes. Charles James is actually quoted in a lecture, and he said, architecture may even help prolong our life. That's a pretty powerful statement. Visitors to these Maggie centers discuss how architecture actively contributes to and enables the way the care is delivered and experienced. So much so that a visitor actually called these buildings a silent carer. So what if I told you now that I could impact how long you would stay in the hospital if you were admitted and how much pain medicine you might take while you're there? And I'm taking off the doctor hat for this one. That's going away. Let's put on the architecture cap. I'm speaking as your architect. How can I do that? The answer is something called evidence-based design, which is modeled after evidence-based medicine. In 1984, the first evidence-based design study was done. It was done by an environmental psychologist, Dr. Roger Ulrich, who's now at the Karolinska. And keep in mind that social science research has been traditionally left out of architectural design studios. But he looked at two groups of patients. They had all had their gallbladders out. They were post-operative from a cholecystectomy. And one group looked at this outside their hospital window, brick wall. The other group looked at this, a park with lots of green. The ones who looked at this group had a shorter length of stay and took less pain medication while they were there. So now 30 years later, we have thousands of these studies. So whether you sustain a fall while you're admitted, 
or acquire a hospital infection, sustain a medication error, or maybe become delirious, all have some relation to the built environment around you. So the acoustics, the lighting, even the sink placement. A 2016 McGill University study quantified this for us. They found that for every additional meter a staff member had to walk to get to a sink, their likelihood of, of washing their hands went down by 10%. What if architecture was treated as a vital part of wellness, prevention, and even active treatment of patients? This is an anecdote, a story about a patient I met my first week as a medical intern in New York City. This is her in the sketch. Her name, we'll call her Miss T. She was in her 80s in this room, which you can see has no window in the intensive care unit. It's an old building. She had a tracheostomy tube and a talk. She was probably a little bit delirious, had a baseline dementia. And her heart rate was very high. We call that tachycardia <coughs> medicine, a fast heart rate. And we couldn't fix it, even with our medications. So on rounds that day, someone said, what if we moved her across the corridor to the window beds? The attending physician said, I'm listening. Show me the evidence. So we looked up the evidence. We found Dr. Ulbricht's study and many more. And we moved her. Overnight, in her window bedroom, she did better. Her heart rate normalized. So I would say that for some patients, where drugs might fail in cure, design might succeed in care. Dr. Dennis Burkett from Burkett's Lymphoma famously said that design can rarely be eliminated through early diagnosis or even good treatment disease, but design might prevent disease. Delirium, which is what Ms. T probably had, is also called acute brain failure, and I'm not sure how many of you are in clinical practice, but delirium is one area that's getting a lot of attention. It's a very serious process that happens mostly when people are hospitalized. You might have had experiences with family members who, in critical care, tend to get confused, agitated, even hallucinate. It has lots of long-term consequences. We're realizing even 12 to 18 months after being discharged, people can perform as if they have mild cognitive impairment. It's a huge cost to society in terms of dollars, but also quality of life. We have no pharmacologic treatments for delirium. Once it happens, it's hard to treat. But we do know that we can prevent it. How do we do it? We reorient the patient. We design spaces that have family members incorporated into the patient room. We also normalize sleep-wake cycles and design windows. And we control the acoustics. All of these are in the preventative algorithm for delirium. They all have some relation to the architecture of the room and the building. So we didn't really know if it was the room change for sure that normalized Ms. T's clinical status overnight. But from that day forward, and this is really the lesson, we kept window bed as part of our care planning in medicine. And even though it's just an anecdote, I think that it can lead to confirmation studies and change can follow. That was an important lesson. So if we know that design can prevent illness, do we have a duty as architects, similar to physicians, to inform our clients of the research I'm talking about and the potential benefits and harms of the spaces we're building. Whose responsibility is it to conduct the research? Architects have taken it on, but I would argue there's no subspecialty in healthcare design research, and there's limited funds to do so. So what about the role of design to ensure that the hospital building does not harm us. This is also from a true story. A patient who was in the exact same ICU as Ms. T was wheeled out of there by me and a few other interns after being in that room for several weeks. And he became tearful when he saw the first window and looked up at the sky. And he literally said, if every prisoner has a window, then every patient should have one too. And that really stuck with me. Healthy design, as you know, is a growing topic. Natural light and ventilation are considered fundamental for all of those incarcerated. But as healthcare architects, we only noted the end of patient rooms without windows in our 2010 building codes. That was only a decade ago. Older facilities, like the one Ms. T is in, are exempt from being renovated. You don't have to put windows in them. This is a new ICU in Boston. You can see floor to ceiling windows. Our new codes dictate mandatory windows in all patient spaces, but the older facilities are exempt. Should we force retrofit if we know windowless rooms to harm? I'll ask a lot of questions, not a lot of answers, but we can have a discussion at the end. What about clinical staff spaces? My favorite topic, being a clinical fellow and immersed in these spaces. 
We have no minimum requirements to give staff members daylight or windows in any of their spaces. This is a lounge at UCSF where I'm currently doing my fellowship. Um, we don't even have to provide respite areas or spaces for emotional expression of staff, and we know that burnout is on the rise. In Europe, contrasted by law, office employees have to be within a few meters of a window in terms of their workspace. People say to me, yes, but our buildings are huge, they're deep, we can't have exterior walls to all rooms. But I would respond by saying we are not limited by exterior walls anymore. If you think about technology, this is a virtual window or a virtual ceiling at the Mount Sinai Emergency Department in New York City. This used to be the geriatric ED and now it's a pediatric space. But we can have day-night and circadian rhythm cycles through technology if we have to. So this leads us to a bigger and probably more important question. To what extent do we as healthcare architects have moral obligations beyond those who are contractually engaged? In today's healthcare climate, there's a lot of pressure on doctors to serve our two masters, and this has been documented in the literature, who bear responsibilities to society, but also duties to their individual patients. This is not unlike the role of healthcare architects. We have a responsibility to act in the public interest, but we often feel that we're just delivering a service to satisfy the clients and their requests. So some questions that arise in my mind are, has the movement towards scientific evidence changed the dynamic between the client and the architect? Has that relationship changed? And do we need a further paradigm shift towards design quality measurement? A lot of architects have reservations about measuring design quality. They say things like, some projects are more complicated than others, It'll expose us to legal error if we measure and find out we made a mistake, or it just won't be fair this way. These same objections clinicians had over 100 years ago in medicine, right, when thinking about medical quality and measurement. But today, all of our medical and surgical procedures are systematically measured. Our first approach is widespread implementation based on evidence in medicine. In evidence-based design, it really started as being focused on patient outcomes with Dr. Ulrich's study. And everywhere in medicine you see headlines like putting patients first, patient-centered care, the patient experience. Whose voice should be prioritized when we're designing and funding these hospitals and healthcare spaces? Should we be building them for the patients and families, or the staff and clinicians who work there tirelessly for decades, or the healthcare clients who are the administrators? And when I use the word clinician during the lecture, I'm really talking about anyone who is involved in patient care, not only physicians, but nurses, pharmacists, <coughs> occupational physical therapy, and anyone who really works with patients. As architects, we impact people who occupy the space pretty directly, but think about others that will be equally affected, even a passers-by through the building, visitors, and even future generations, right? We build hospitals that last a long time. We need to ask who is affected and in what way when we're building them. We can learn lessons from history, so let's go back. There are times when health and design have converged and healthcare was seen as a form of treatment when you consider the built space. This is the 1800s insane asylum. This was in Massachusetts, it no longer stands. But it set a precedent for the building as treatment. At that time, it was felt people with mental illness could not be treated in their homes and had to be removed. And although the ethical principles of patient autonomy and personal freedom are pretty removed from this type of architecture, I would say that the ethics of psychiatric facility design are still deeply rooted in beneficence or trying to do good. In 1854, Thomas Story Kirkbride, who was an MD, he changed the approach to mental health architecture in the United States. He emphasized the need for these types of spaces so that patients would have moral treatment with sunlight, ventilation, and land. And I want you to note that he was a clinician, and he was involved in this whole design uh, re-envisioning for psychiatric facilities. He also considered staff. If you can see the floor plan at the bottom, you'll see this is looking down like a bird's eye view. There'll be a few floor plans, and we'll get a little crash course in architecture today. But they're very long and narrow, right? And we call them double loaded, with rooms on each side. So all the spaces get a lot of ventilation and natural light, even staff spaces. That was something they thought about. Here's a similar example, the tuberculosis sanatoria that were built in the 19th and early 20th centuries. They also illustrate design as a contributing factor to treatment, and they were essentially planned to give patients a lot of access to nature. 
thinking that this would help in recovery, but also preventing spread of disease. And this is the Pioneer Sanatorium in Finland that I visited as an undergraduate student and changed my whole career that day. I shifted towards clinical thinking in med school. It made such a big impact to walk into that space. It was so different from any hospital I've ever seen. It was designed by Oliver Alto, the very well-known Finnish architect. And it's really a wonderful space, a national heritage site. It still functions as a general hospital. But Alto did something interesting. He really considered all the users of the space. So these are the door handles that he designed so clinician white coats would never catch on them as they walked by. He also designed the famous pineal chair that you see in my sketch. He knew that tuberculosis affected the lungs. People had sputum. They had a hard time breathing. So he calculated the exact angle of the chair so patients would be able to recline and feel comfortable when they were taking a breath. He also designed communal dining. Patients who were there, staff, would eat in these wonderful spaces. Very different from today when our nursing home residents and patients all eat in their rooms. We don't see this very often anymore. And physicians certainly aren't eating their patients. Some of you might recognize this, but I wanted to talk about the power of design to impact our behavior. This is Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon prison design. It was considered the perfect prison. It was essentially a radio building, for those of you who haven't seen this type of design before. So one person could stand at the center and observe the activities of all of the prisoners around. The inmates couldn't see into the center, into the, into the watchful tower. So because they couldn't see in, they assumed they were always being watched. And the theory was that then they would always rule abide and behave if they couldn't tell if they were being watched or not. The building's ultimate goal here was designed for psychological control. The essential principle behind his proposal that design can influence people is manifested widely around us in the everyday built world. So think about it, considering, think about the Renaissance, so consider the awe-inspiring heights of a cathedral ceiling, or the reds and yellows being used in fast food restaurants to make you eat more. Many architects and designers see it as part of their job to prompt these feelings and reactions, and I think with all the new science explaining these responses, it will only make them easier to induce. The American Institute of Architects, the AIA, is the professional body that represents all of the registered architects in the United States. They have a code of ethics and professional conduct. It states that members should uphold human rights in all of their professional endeavors, and they should design buildings and spaces that respect health, safety, and welfare of both individuals, but also the public. What does the code not say? It actually doesn't say directly, do no harm, like the Hippocratic Oath does in medicine. But I would say that buildings can't necessarily heal directly, but they can prevent illness and enhance health, as I've suggested. I think the ethical implications of what architects create rarely gets discussed and is not mentioned in our code. There are likely inequities and injustices embedded into our healthcare buildings. The American College of Health Architects is sort of a subspecialty board, so as a general architect, you can become board certified in healthcare architecture. Sort of like becoming a pulmonologist or nephrologist after you've done general internal medicine. The ACHA has no code ethics. We just realized that this year, so we're writing on it. I would probably argue, too, that healthcare architects have specific obligations to address the health, safety, and welfare of the users of these spaces. This is a sketch from a visit I did to Alcatraz Prison a number of years ago. But after much lobbying, the AIA has taken a very strong position to consider a ban on any professional in design using their skills and knowledge for certain projects, projects notably isolation chambers, solitary confinement rooms, and torture rooms. They're about to make a decision on that in the next week or two. But I wonder, is the solution to remove architects and designers from this issue? Physicians and nurses have removed themselves from lethal injection or capital punishment. But should we stay involved and ensure better design of these spaces and maybe advocate for change? What about locked memory units? doing a geriatric fellowship right now in medicine. I see a lot of patients with dementia. How do we address dementia through design? And are we designing hospitals that function as prisons? 
We have a long history of deploying deception as architects in buildings to achieve either an aesthetic or a practical end. Some examples going back in history, we use blank windows to make the front of a building appear more symmetrical, or we encase columns to make them appear more substantial when they're not. Common in these dementia units is the building itself acting as a restraint. Right? We've painted over the exit doors. Is it okay for architects to fool the eye of a cognitively impaired person? In the absence of any better options right now, dementia design and care, I personally believe it's one of the current solutions we have and can utilize. We try to ensure there's not as much harm by doing this than if the person were to leave and get lost or hit by a bus leaving the unit. What about this design solution? Some of you may have seen this. There's actual literature on this. We paint black floor squares or tiles in front of exit doors and elevators. Many people with cognitive impairment perceive these colors as a void or hole in the floor. I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty terrified to walk into a complete black hole. So they're inducing fear of leaving the idea. Make people afraid so they won't leave the building. Is this okay? Or does this cause some kind of indirect harm? This is an ACE unit, an acute care for elders unit I worked on recently in San Francisco. While I was working there, a few of the physicians made the comment that the floor was highly reflective, which we know in dementia care can cause problems. Patients can perceive it as wet and slippery. They don't want to walk. But notice the stripes, too. It's interesting that some of the attendings noticed people with vascular dementia or Parkinson's disease had a lot of trouble overcoming that pattern and couldn't walk in the hall. The architects have left this building, right? This has been the ribbons cut. They're using this building. So who should speak up about the flooring? Is it the responsibility of the doctors or the administrators? Do we bring the architects back? So we know design can't necessarily treat disease, I've said that a couple of times, but it's an important tool in care strategies. Evidence-based design practice has inspired the emergence of dementia care design in order to promote autonomy, so moving away from the locked unit. We have research that connects architecture and neuroscience. We actually have an academy of architecture for neuroscience as well. And we've shown an overlap between the areas of our brains that deal with spatial navigation and those that are affected in early onset Alzheimer's and early phase Alzheimer's. So we need design solutions that can combat all the confusion people feel and help with their spatial disorientation. This has been published in the media. It's 10 years old now. It was the very first dementia village in the world. It's in the Netherlands. It's called Tahadwik. And it promotes the idea of permissive wandering. So let's not conceal those doors. Let's get people to wander. It's part of what they need to do, complete their everyday activities. Residents are free to visit amenities like the grocery store, a pub, a hair salon, a movie theater. Staff who work there have anecdotally reported a decrease in agitation and psychoactive medication use over time. This is also the dementia village. So this idea of freedom of movement and meaningful activity within village settings, it's really preferred, but we don't have any minimum design guidelines to say we need to do this going forward. And the Dementia Village itself has become a little bit controversial. There's been a new one built in Canada on the West Coast. It's been called a therapeutic illusion or an architectural placebo. Maybe it's simply a modern panopticon. It's an architectural equivalent of total, total surveillance, right? And residents don't agree to go there. We also design spaces that induce immobility. In the 1970s, we did a lot of social isolation studies. We had healthy male volunteers in their 20s, and we strapped them to beds. Wanted to see how long it took them to have sensory disturbances in perception. It's about just over two hours. And it got worse when we took away any sounds around them or social interaction. I have to say, that's pretty much what we do to people in the hospital. Elderly patients in hospital often enter sick, but they leave completely disabled. And it's not because of why they came in. We can treat a pneumonia, we can treat a urinary tract infection. It's because of the bed rest that they were subjected to in hospital. When we design rooms, and this is a patient room in floor plan, so you can see the bed, that's really the focal point for architects. We plunk the bed down and we design around that. But maybe we need to move away from the bed as the focal point of design. There's no therapeutic value to bed rest, Dr. Creditor states in a very well-known paper in the early 90s. Do we have a better way? 
think we need design solutions that blur the home hospital design continuum, especially for aging patients. And so just as doctors advocate for health, lawyers for justice, architects need to advocate for spaces which improve people's lives in general. We've contributed indirectly to the inactivity of patients, leading to very poor outcomes. Canada has two national campaigns right now. One is called In Chairs for Meals. We need to get these patients out of bed to eat and have some social interaction in communal dining rooms, like we saw in the tuberculosis sanatorium. We also have something called End of PJ Paralysis. If you're on Twitter, you've seen that. If you're in a hospital gown or your PJs, you're going to want to stay in bed, right? Get people dressed. These initiatives are being led by clinicians and the clinical arena, not by architects. So should we also have a voice? I think we probably should. There's a well-known geriatrician, Dr. Bernardo Isaacs, and he said, if you design for the old, you include the young. But if you design for the young, you exclude the old. This is a pediatric exam room at the Shriners Hospital in Boston. You can see it using whimsical themes, color, targeted lighting to improve the experience. But I would argue this type of design also appears to adult care and geriatric medicine too. We don't have any, min any minimum guidelines in architecture to dictate how we decorate pediatric hospitals. Should we? And why have adult care spaces lost that design element? Here's another room. The concept of universal or all-inclusive design focuses on environments that can be accessed and used no matter what your age, size, ability, and disability. So whether you're 92 and you have a walker, you're two years old and taking your first steps, or maybe you're 32 and sprain your ankle and have crutches for six weeks, all of those people should be able to use the same space efficiently and effectively. This also includes staff who work in the buildings. I want to make that point very clear because I want to talk about clinical staff and architecture. Medicine has crusaded to improve the idea of transparency and promote patient autonomy. I think we're all aware of that. But the architectural process of hospital design and construction is still shrouded in this level of mystery to its users. The medical literature, interestingly, often refers to architecture and how clinicians perceive these spaces. Some of you might have read Dr. Howard Brody's The Healer's Power book. In the early part of the book, he provides us with a clinical interpretation of why hospitals are designed the way they are. So he writes, did you think it was an accident that most hospital buildings are mazes and corridors at different levels and different wings broken by unexpected ramps and stairways and blank walls? Sounds like a lot of hospitals I've been in that have been built up over time. He writes further, no visitor and hardly any patient can find their way around, but those who work there are people who have penetrated these mysteries. Can architecture have the power to support the caregiver's ability to heal and deliver care? I would say there's often a gap between our design intent and then the final user experience. This is a classic example in urban planning class 101. The professor will tell you on the first day, if you want to design a university campus, design the buildings all you want, locate them where you want, but don't pave the paths to the buildings. Plant grass seed, wait a year. And as you can see, whatever you pave is not what people are going to use, right? The users are going to find the most efficient way. Let's apply this clinically. So as physicians, we're taught to examine patients from the right-hand side. This is a picture from the Columbia Presbyterian Archives. You can see the medical student learning to examine this patient, probably mostly due to convention. We do this in Europe, too. Maybe right-handedness of physicians, and then also because we're not symmetrical. Right? Our livers are on the right. We look at certain blood vessels in the neck to assess volume status. But it's so strict in medicine, at least when I was in medical school, if you did not approach from the right during a clinical exam, you would lose points and potentially fail the exam. This was my clinic exam room for about three years as a medical resident. Can I access the patient from the right-hand side? No. I found this really impacted the way I delivered care and was taught to deliver care. And this illustrates the design intent and user experience. Is hospital design equitable? Could the workplace itself somehow be harmful to its workers? And has our design pendulum swung too heavily towards patient-centered care and away from the healthcare staff? I think it has, and clinicians agree, and they're speaking up. This is. Uh, an op-ed that was published in Canada's national newspaper last spring, the Globe and Mail. 
when I first read the headline late on a Friday night, I was taking the whole night writing a letter in response. I mean, how could this physician write architects of ruined healthcare? Josh Melandi is an ICU doctor in Toronto. So I wrote a letter and I called him up. Turns out he actually had a good point. He said that we're physically hiding the messy part of healthcare, and that devalues the role of medical people who work there. Their skills are underappreciated. He also writes in his piece, let's be clear, healthcare that does not look like healthcare is not healthcare. It's a sort of theater created to distract an audience of anxious patients, and it's a funhouse mirror version of patient-centered care. It's more important to pretend you're not sick than to be perfectly treated. Here's an example of what Dr. Landy is talking about. This, I try to blend my slides to location sometimes, but this is Boston. You can see the skylines. It's a hospital in Boston, and this is a wonderful rooftop garden. This is the sign you see when you approach the door. This healing garden is for patients and families. Restricted staff use. What kind of message does this send? This is also a very different approach to what we talked about with the asylum design or the sanatorium design of blending people together and having more of a design equity. Physicians and clinicians in general are receiving conflicting messages about their own well-being. What's the role of the healthcare architect in advocating for clinician health? Our physician lounges are widely a thing of the past that's been written about. And with the doctor's lounge now almost non-existent, where is that hub of activity where we can form these relationships and develop care plans and thrive as doctors? This is where I thought it was as a resident. This is the egress or fire stair. We couldn't use the elevators to go between floors on patient rounds due to HIPAA and privacy laws, so we used the egress stairs. We would have wonderful conversations with our consultants we would bump into and develop excellent care plans in just a few minutes. And in my sketchbook at the time, I tried to keep a design notebook and a medical notebook, quite coat, I envisioned an open staircase, not kind of drab and closed fire stair, but an open staircase designed in the hospital with alcoves and landings where people could have these interactions and foster better care planning. The rise of patient-centered care means that in addition to those open spaces and all those familiar coffee shops, there's little signs of the technical aspect of medical care. We don't want patients to bump into their doctors. We've tried to do what Disney World has done. On stage and off stage, we separate users. For Disney World, you're not seeing the food trays going down under the tunnel and not seeing the support staff. We even designed separate corridors for clinicians now. Designers and administrators really expect the healthcare professionals to interact primarily with patients in designated places. Clinical exam room, for instance, not in the corridors or the cafeteria. But I don't know that they're considering our staff collegiality. This is something from communication theory, it's called the Allen Curve, and it graphically represents an exponential drop in the frequency of communication between engineers as the distance between them increases. It was discovered in the 1970s by Thomas Allen at MIT, who was a professor there, and he found that the farther apart workstations are, this was dealing with engineers, the less communication there was between them. And he said we're four times as likely to communicate regularly if someone is six feet away from us than 60 feet. Kind of makes sense. And we're almost never going to talk to someone on a separate floor or in a separate building. Do we think that architecture can encourage collisions and remedy some of this social isolation? It definitely can. I would say medicine needs to catch up with other organizations that have recognized the importance of promoting interdisciplinary interaction. Buildings can keep us warm. They can ensure our privacy. But they also connect us spatially and temporally. This is a wonderful place, the Salk Institute in La Jolla in San Diego, California, designed by Louis Kahn, the famous architect, or Jonas Salk, the inventor of the polio vaccine. It's really a wonderful space. I would encourage you all to visit. Architects are focusing on space design to foster face-to-face -face interactions in this particular example. The architect didn't restrict the lab building to just the laboratories. That whole open center space is full of blackboards and spaces to gather because we know that 80% of scientific breakthroughs don't happen isolated at your lab bench. They happen when you're talking to other colleagues. This is probably true in the clinical setting for care plans when we talk about patients. This is a grant-funded study we're doing right now at UCSF. We're looking at house staff, medical residents, and fellows, and where they're located. We did focus groups and a survey, and we asked them, where do you sit, where do you want to sit, how do you feel? 
And you can see on the top diagram, this is what we call an architectural section where we slice through the building like a piece of cake. They're all over the place, right? Each specialty has its own floor or a space on that floor. And they're saying we've lost our sense of community. We feel burnt out, depressed, isolated as fellows and residents. This is what we want. We want something like the bottom when we're all located together and we can turn to a colleague, ask them how they're doing, and talk about a patient. I think this would improve their own well-being, but also provide a sense of community in medicine again, which has been lacking. And I think buildings have contributed to that. If we take this all into one vision for staff, this is an interesting rendering put together by a Canadian firm, Santec Architecture, modeled after a European example. Do you all remember the atrium hospital, which was very common in the early 90s? The central atrium where you had the Starbucks and the shops and the water fountain. What if this wasn't for patients and staff? This is what these architects are asking. What if this was only for clinicians and the staff who work in the hospital? Patients and families get another space. They could come out of their offices and clinical exam rooms, talk to each other, have some nature, have some daylight, and have a place for moments of respite. Interesting concept. Clinicians are trying to get into hospital design. They're realizing these spaces are impacting them, both their health and their care delivery of patients. This was the cover of ACP American College of Physicians Hospitalist Magazine last year. Clinicians are diving into hospital design. Every week on average, they get between one, two, three, sometimes four students in medicine or medical residents or fellows, young professionals saying, I want training in design as a doctor or a clinician in healthcare. John at the University of Massachusetts wrote to me and said he's dreamed of caring for patients, but he also wants to design products. How can he do that? I've had surgeons call and say, if my operating room was designed differently, I could operate better and faster. Other physicians have called and said, how has architecture changed the way medicine and care is delivered? Very interesting questions that link the two fields. Physicians have spoken up. In fact, if any of you are clinicians in the room, you'll probably at one point in your career go get involved in some renovation or new construction project of your hospital or workspace. So it's a good idea to know a little bit about health design. <coughs> this is a unique critical care unit plan where I've only seen two in the United States. The floor plan that you see is interesting because the patient rooms are not lining the perimeter. It's a corridor. And that corridor was designed just for families and visitors. So they would have a separate space to go, places for rest, and they could access their loved ones' rooms separate from the clinical staff. It tends to work very well in critical care. And the photograph behind is Lowell General in Massachusetts. There, the physicians felt so strongly that in that corridor we needed well-designed rooms to break bad news because they said it's not just what they hear, it's the space people are in when they hear that news that affects them forever. We need to have windows, lighting, comfortable seating. They donated their own money to design and build two of these that's how involved clinicians want to be and feel that design can impact them and the people who use their spaces. And I think we have to remember that the building design also has to consider clinical processes and models of care, right? We need that pendulum to come and rest more in the middle. So design is mutually beneficial for patients, staff, and families. This is from a blog I wrote recently talking about design equity, but thinking about the clinic exam room. Medicine is not about the paternalistic physician at the, behind a big desk talking to a patient and telling them what to do. We've now moved on to what we call a shared decision-making model where patients, families, and physicians discuss together and figure out a care plan. The idea of a round table where everybody is equal is something we think about in clinic design and not emphasizing the big bulky exam table because realistically in 15 minutes we don't examine everyone. You can have a separate room for that if you need to really trying to have the architecture match the models of care and where medicine is going, I think is important. So how do architects and clinicians find a balance between health, illness, and design? I think by together inspiring the emergence of a new mode of practice. So increasingly, as I've alluded to, professionals in both healthcare and design are seeking this shared knowledge and expertise what they really want is something called an anastomosis, which represents the connection of two structures that are normally divergent. So in medicine, we think of blood vessels, as I've tried to indicate here in the graphic, that you would link, or maybe loops of bowel. You can anastomose things in surgery. So this connection of separate systems then forms a network, like a river and its branches. I think we would all agree that the field of healthcare and medicine is changing. 
medicine is looking at the value of having social sciences and the humanities incorporated in training their next generation of doctors and clinicians, but medicine is also progressively adopting scientific evidence and research methodology in terms of the domain of health architecture. So the clinical practice of healthcare in the fields of architecture, planning, and design have traditionally been and occupied very different professional, social, and cultural worlds. And there's been few opportunities for this cross-disciplinary interaction, I would say. But all these emerging professionals in architecture and medicine are asking to move beyond these infrequent intersections and really create a true anastomosis of fields. And so let's circle back now. Where does bioethics fit? Architectural mastery has traditionally been when a building is both beautiful and also good. But architects have a responsibility to open up people's thinking about the world around them and how they might see it and also occupy it. This includes clinicians in their spaces. Buildings give us a connection to those who came before us in history, but also to future generations. So we design buildings to last at least 50 years if we can, hopefully more. Architects can help people envision what doesn't even yet exist. So I think healthcare architecture can and should act as a facilitator for models of care, health policy, and clinician workspace. And just as medicine uses an ethical awareness to encourage and empower the clinicians, I think architecture can benefit from this bioethics lens as well to more successfully navigate some of our challenges on both the individual and the institutional and public health level. Bioethics can really sensitize our profession to the impact of our decisions, actions, and behaviors on others. And I would argue that bioethics is not a brick in this graphic that I've developed over time. I would say that it acts as the mortar, what Gail was talking about as the glue, but it acts as the mortar here when we think about a framework to the social determinants of health. So I think it's time for a new version of healthcare architecture in which designers and architects can facilitate connections, can enable access, improve health, and enhance equity through our designs and our architecture, with less of a focus on overall aesthetics and much more on designs that can tangibly improve people's lives and the health of all of our individuals and communities on a bigger level. Thank you very much. I'd love to hear some comments or thoughts. I mean, we talked about a lot of different things, so maybe we'll open it up to questions. Hi, I'm Justin Burstein. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here. Um, thanks so much for your talk. It's agenda setting, it seems to me. I just wanted to ask, I guess, a question that's being pretty down the road. Um, so obviously multiple architectural factors go into patient well-being. So you mentioned sinks being nearby. I mean, that doctors are more likely to wash their hands. I imagine if I were a patient, I wouldn't be that happy if there were sinks everywhere. So I guess I would imagine there are going to be sorts of trade-offs between different architectural dimensions that affect patient well-being. And then you also brought up sort of the, the well-being of the doctors as well. So I guess I just wanted to hear more about how we should think about trading off between these different sort of determinants of wealthy architectural determinants. Yeah, that's a good question. I think architects are trained and really struggle with that sometimes, how to balance everybody's needs in the same space. I think in response to your sink comment, that's an interesting one. I think it speaks to what Dr. Landy was saying in his op-ed. If something can make clinical outcomes better, and I think the public would actually be okay with it, even though aesthetically it might not be as pleasing. There's some data to suggest that people are pretty aware when they go into hospitals as patients of their environment. About 25% of their patient experience points are about the physical space. So making them beautiful is important, and we often give a percentage of our budget over to artwork, up to 1% of the budget. That's a lot in multi-billion dollar hospitals. But I agree, we have to balance staff needs, and there are design solutions. You know, it can be tricky, and I agree, we have to make trade-offs, and sometimes we value engineer things out, but I don't think we can keep value engineering out clinician staff wellness spaces. Often clients will say, well, the perimeters where the windows are, those have to be given to patients because those are revenue-generating spaces. We can put the staff in the middle. There's a little closet there. They can have their lounge there, like the one I showed you. I don't think it works, and I think the only way we'll change that is to have clinicians and medicine understand the evidence and figure out how we can somehow make it more equitable for everybody. And in some of the older hospitals and designs, they do that better than we do today, I would argue. But it's definitely a design challenge, and it's pretty independent to each project. 
But that said, you know, I'm not sure each project should be so independent, right? You build one ER and it works really well, but then you go off to another client or another firm is doing a project and they start from scratch. We're often doing that as architects. So maybe the answer to your question is we really need to build on these guidelines and frameworks so that when something goes well and we come up with a design solution, we replicate it. I should mention that that Ulrich study was never replicated. And so we kind of built a whole subspecialty research division on that one study with an N of 46, I think. Um, it's a little interesting to think about that. ago in pediatric palliative care in the UK and visited a few pediatric hospices and every single patient room opened out to a garden and this was a particular hospice for um, boys with muscular dystrophy who were severely disabled and not really able to move and then technology came in and they were able to through automated systems open the door to the garden and the whole bed went out into the garden. Wow. It was incredible. And there were several hours a day that we, the boys were sort of expected to just hang out in the garden. Um, my question actually has to do with one of the things that I think we're struggling with in the building of our, our new building here. Um, and that has to do with uh, security and safety. And you know, a lot of academic medical centers, uh, several, are in urban areas and sort of viewed as the ivory tower and we're making an effort to, to try to bring the community in and improve relationships that we have with our surrounding community. And so we're building a building where, you know, we want there to be community space and there's a lot of concern about security. And I'm, I'm just curious how, how architects think about that. I was really struck by your your dementia unit that was kind of locked, but you didn't know it was locked. Good questions. And just to go back to your first point about the hospice, so this sketch that I showed you is actually of an ICU in Portland, Oregon. And these are floor to ceiling breakaway doors so they can open up and patients can be wheeled out onto a terrace. I have to say, it sounds great, right? The sketch looks fantastic. I would want to be in this ICU. But when you went back and asked the clients years later, they actually don't use it. Because the terrace is a communal space, and so HIPAA guidelines and pushing multiple sick patients out to see each other didn't work very well. So I think a caveat to architecture is we can develop perfect design solution, which we think is perfect, but then when users move in and use the space, you can expect changes. So even when your building is open and a ribbon is cut and everybody comes in, I would expect and I would even welcome comments from people using the building to make these post-occupancy changes, and that's okay. You raise a good point with the security. I think there's sort of two levels when you think about security. There's the level of the building, the walls, and the bricks and mortar, and how can that maybe act inviting? But then there's a level of security once you're inside through much more of a process once you're in the building that's run by people or various stations. But I think the building itself should be welcoming, as you suggest. But that's definitely a design challenge, more so in the United States. I have to say in Canada and Australia, where I worked for a year, it didn't come up as much. I always find that when I try to come into these hospital buildings, everyone stops me. I can't really walk anywhere. <laughs> but you have a unique opportunity, I think, through the new building to connect, as you say, and make these connections and invite the community in. I think that's fantastic. And architecture can do that. The Maggie Centers do that very well. Also, if you have, if you don't have questions, but you have comments, and any of these images resonate with you, if you worked in these spaces, or some of you clinicians, so some of you are probably familiar with the Hastings Center and the Hastings Center report that comes out. They actually ran initially in 2011 that touched on design and health. But as I mentioned, the ethics of build space is largely understudied and underpublished in bioethics, but they're actually developing a new issue and thinking about the impact of architecture mostly to do with climate change, but we're trying to expand it. If any of you have thoughts on that or want to contribute, let me know. Yeah, um, thank you again for the great talk. I'm a 
I'm intrigued by the seeming challenge of creating um, deceptive spaces, I guess. Um, and, um, I would first love to hear your thought, more thoughts on that, and sort of what you, what's your take on it. Um, but related maybe to Gail's comment about technology, um, I guess I'm, I'm also thinking a bit about sort of willful deception, sort of putting people in scenarios where you know, let's say a virtual space, or um, right, using virtual reality or other technologies that are very common now and are developing rapidly. Um, what, how does that fit into your model of thinking about architecture and the future in hospitals, and whether you know, might be opportunities or risks? Yeah, that's a good question. The question about virtual reality. So there's been some studies published thinking about virtual reality and patient care, right? Thinking about immersing dementia patients in a virtual reality in their home many years ago or somewhere they like to be, or not just dementia patients, any patient. Architects have been thinking about virtual reality in a different way. Why do we need to spend 10 years, and that's how long it takes to build one of these big fancy cancer buildings, why do we need to spend 10 years and billions of dollars to build it only to discover it doesn't work? Could we pre-experience the building? So there's been some thought given to this idea of post-occupancy evaluation, study the building when it's built, or can you use VR and other technologies to pre-experience and measure reactions before the building's built? And that's a very controversial topic. If there's any architects in the room, I don't think there are, but it terrifies architects to think that our profession would change so much and we would have these virtual buildings. We do use building information modeling now and sort of construct the building and all the support services within a model. We don't generally draw two dimensions anymore. But VR is thinking about ways to measure building experience. And I actually think that would be very interesting if we could get that off the ground. These initiatives are not being taken on by architects, mostly by startups and sort of clinical entities. In terms of deception, I think it's a very loaded word and has a bit of a negative connotation. And if you all read the closer blog this morning site had written an article about design and deception in relation to dementia care. And for this afternoon, I thought some of the fellows and postdocs and I could delve further into it and whether that might be okay. I think you know it all comes down to harm and benefits. And as I suggested, concealing those walls as opposed to having patients go out and get lost, which has happened in one of our nursing homes in San Francisco recently, we have to weigh that. And I think what we're trying to do with geriatricians and architects who design these spaces is at least meet patients in their current truths. Whether it's okay to design a 1940s bus stop or car where a patient thinks they're going to go to work, but they really aren't, it calms them down and then they shift and divert their attention to something else and we don't need to use a sedative, maybe that's okay. It's pretty, it's pretty controversial. But thank you for the comments. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you quoted Dr. Bergen as saying something about design impacting the care process, and, and I think you said specifically, he said it can't really affect an improvement in diagnosis and certain other elements. But I wonder about your thoughts on the design impacting errors in uh, the practice of medicine, healthcare, uh, if not necessarily diagnosis. So I'll, I'll be interested to hear what you had to say about that. But errors in general. The topic. There's some literature on that issue. We've looked at medication room design specifically. So on each ward, you have your medication center where people, will, nurses mostly will dose medications. Maybe the pharmacist is involved. And we've noted that lighting will impact number of errors made. So we design these spaces very carefully. Um, I think the problem is we haven't necessarily measured it. So there's something called same-handed rooms in architecture. If you imagine a long floor plan, you can duplicate one room after the other like a cookie cutter so that when you walk in, it's all the same, like every Target and McDonald's and whatever Walmart that we've ever been into, we know where to go and get something. So the thinking is that if there's a cardiac arrest and the nurse or doctor runs in, they'll know exactly where to reach, they don't have to think. They can just reach for the crash cart or push a button and it's the same everywhere. This hypothesis that has never been proven, in fact, research has shown it doesn't matter, versus the other way to be to mirror rooms. Right, so they would be different handedness if you walked in. We do that so we can double up on services, head walls with oxygen and different medical gases, a bit cheaper and easier to do. So we've never proven that same handedness actually reduces errors, but it's driven the design of many, many hospital wards just based on this one theory, which is why I speak about evidence based design so strongly. I think it's imperative that we start measuring these outcomes. 
And many people will tell me there's no way you can measure the built environment, you can't study architecture, there's too many confounding variables. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think through statistical structuring and analysis and methodologies, there can be ways to measure these impacts. On patient safety, thinking about falls also. So there's a lot of talk a few years ago about should we have single patient rooms or is it okay if patients share the room? Right? Everyone remembers the two bed or four bedded rooms. You might even have some here and some of the other buildings. We got rid of those because of patient falls and patient safety. It was shown that private rooms, patients did better. They actually fell less. People thought if you had a shared room, your roommate would call someone if you were about to fall. But everyone found out that they just drew their curtains and nobody would call. And in a private room, it's more likely that your family or visitors are going to sit there and only have somebody. So I think measurement is key, but I think design definitely has a role in medical error and patient safety. I'm happy to send on some papers if you're interested. Um, hey, I'm one of the cardiac acid fellows here in Melinda. Um, I thought it was interesting, you touched a little bit on designing ORs and how that can lead to, you know, both surgeons and kind of the rest of the team members thinking that the operation is going more smoothly. We talk a lot in credit surgery sort of about hybrid ORs where we make it, you know, have the ability that we can collaborate with vascular surgeons to do endovascular things or cardiologists doing angiography. But is there any research or have people thought about how the actual operating room itself can affect surgeon team of the well-being. I've operated in one set of ORs that actually had floor to ceiling windows. And I'm kind of torn because normally the operating room is like the stark cold kind of space you go into. There's nothing happy about it. It's, you know, you're there, you're there for 10 or 12 hours, but like time is not progressing. But what I noticed with those ORs is like it, it was a congenital OR. So if the case lasted 10 or 12 hours, you actually kind of saw that they, <laughs> that they had like the sun went up and went down and it's dark and you're still in there. So I'm just curious what kind of impact that's had or what people have said about sort of the design of the operating room itself. So design of ORs is another subspecialty kind of topic. I've heard mixed comments and similar comments to what you said. And in Europe, it's much more common for operating rooms to have windows. I have a great image of one with the floor to ceiling windows. Like you suggest, it's less accepted here. And people will say, well, we need to have our technologies and we have to black everything out, so why would we have windows? But you can do that with windows and technology. Um, I don't think anyone's ever studied or compared an operating room design that has windows versus one that doesn't. What we try to often do is have the OR itself have no windows, but then the corridor right outside have windows, so we assume staff will get some natural daylight. But I've heard that comment before where staff say, well, then I don't know how much time has passed. Is that better or worse? And I don't think I have a scientific answer for you. I think OR design is in hot debate also, and each institution tends to do it a little differently. The size of the room matters quite a bit. So at one point, we were supersizing all our healthcare spaces. The rooms were getting bigger, 200 square feet, 400 square feet. And we realized there's a point where things become inefficient if they're too big, right? If it would take you or your colleagues too long to traverse the OR, or too long to get the sterile equipment in and out, because it adds different seconds. So there is a point where the operating room doesn't work well in terms of size. There's been good data on that. In the interest of time, we are at time. Please join me in thanking Dr. Anderson.